Thank y'all so much. Um, what an amazing turnout. Um, this is what neighborhoods are about, and I'm honored to be able to uh, represent you all as uh, the Council 6 or District 6 Council Member. Uh, my name is Dr. Jared Williams, um, and I'll just kind of give uh, the welcome and kind of a rundown of what we're going to do today, and then I'll hand it off. Um, so. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, Westminster uh, uh, Presbyterian Church for their hospitality and opening their doors uh, for us. Um, so let's give um, um, the team here a warm uh, hand clap for uh, hosting us. Um, so today, um, it's no surprise we're here to uh, give an update on um, egrets. Of course, they are in their migratory um, season here in Fort Worth, they're nesting. Um, and so our goal really is to um, bring a couple of our city departments, code compliance and animal control, uh, for them to give an update about where we are um, in this season in terms of some of the activities that we're doing to respond to, um, you know, the real impacts that egrets uh, nesting um, are having in our neighborhoods. Um, and then once our um, city representatives give you an update on kind of what we're doing this season, um, I'll come back up and I'll talk about what uh, me and my office are doing um, to create a long-term plan to, to ensure that we're proactive um, with addressing egrets. And it's going to take all of us, um, you know, all hands on deck with this plan. Um, and so I'll give you an update on what we're proposing to my colleagues on council um, and working alongside our city departments like code compliance and animal control um, to ensure that um, we're addressing this issue, um, you know, more proactively and um, thinking about the long-term future of the impacts that e egrets have on our homes and uh, most importantly on our pocketbooks and our budget. I know that um, egrets nesting uh, generates unexpected bills um, for our families um, and it is my uh, sincerest priority um, to ensure that um, our office does everything that we can to ensure long term that um, we're reducing those impacts on you, your family, and our neighbors. Um, so um, without uh, further ado, I'm going to invite uh, Barry Alexander. Um, he's going to give you all an update um, on, on what we're doing to address uh, the, the uh, immediate impact of egrets. And again, we'll come back um, and give more updates. Um, at the conclusion, we'll open the floor up, and my district director, Kendall Locke, um, will open the floor up to hear uh, questions. Um, and um, me and the team uh, will be able to field your questions and also any um, issues that you're having. Um, we'll be able to connect with you directly and make sure that we're um, helping you find the answers and solutions to um, your specific issues as well. So um, without any further ado, um, Barry, folks. Thank you, Barry. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, some of you I know I've met in the uh, fight with the egrets. And then some of you have not, for all those of you that uh, have not met, I'm Barry Alexander. I'm a, one of the field supervisors under the Code Compliance Department in Animal Control. Um, we got involved in this a few years ago with a fight with the egrets because they got in and nested and we weren't aware of it and then we got notified. So we've been fighting these things and so we did some things uh, in pre preparation for Candle Ridge because we knew they were coming back and we've all got very well schooled as some of the neighbors have in Egrid. So we got, uh, did some things. We got a permit to help us with the Egrids and uh, it wasn't what we'd hoped for but it, it helped a lot and we, we, along with everybody in the Candle Ridge neighborhood, we fought them, and uh, to all respectively, we won. But they got the the problem is once they nest, you run them off. They fly very fast and very low, and they're really hard to keep up with. So if you, someone doesn't actually see them in their trees, and it's too late, they build a nest. And once they build that nest, we've still got a little leeway. But once they lay those eggs, we're in trouble. Then it becomes an issue. So the permit kind of helps us through some of that, and, and uh, we're going to definitely be applying that, applying for another permit and uh, sending our report into the state and doing some things like that. And then, of course, preparing and trying to get the word out what to look for. Um, over on Winchester, they're already nested, they've already got uh, eggs, and on top of that, 
now we're, the, the birds are, are being kicked out of the nest, so the fledglings uh, are being kicked out of the nest. So every day the code compliance department's been, animal control's been going by there and picking up injured and dead birds. It's just, that's their survival thing. They, they have three or four young, the nests aren't big enough for them, so they end up kicking some of the babies out. So it's just a normal thing. Uh, so we're seeing birds on the ground. We're seeing uh, baby birds in down, and we're also seeing young birds in, in feathers, which we know now we've got a waiting period. So it gets really nasty. We're trying to do what we can, but we're picking up the dead birds, and we're picking up the injured ones, and then we're thinking that Unfortunately, the way they got nested in there is probably going to be to the end of August before somewhere around there when they get when they'll finally be old enough to fly off. So we're hoping it's earlier than that, uh, uh, you know, but I don't suspect it will be so. Oh, hello, everyone. My name is Neil Johnson. I'm with Code Compliance also, but a different area. Um, I'm with Code Compliance Solid Waste Division. Um, I'm actually the superintendent over solid waste. I'm on a different end. Um, first of all, I sympathize or empathize with you guys on what's going on. We've, we're, we're learning as we're going along as of the past year uh, and trying to do our best to educate and, and, uh, and, and make things a lot better in the future. Um, so my, on, my job is to make things, once, once the egrets have nested, to make things a little bit easier or, or bearable with street sweeping and also litter pickup throughout your, throughout your neighborhoods. I don't know if you've, meant, you've seen the street sweepers come through on Winchester and even on the other end last year, they're coming through approximately three times a week uh, and sweeping those effective areas along the curbside. So, we try not to let the accumulation, uh, you know, um, uh, get too far um, before we get the, the street sweepers out to, to clean those areas. The one thing that I ask that you do, we try to stay away from Fridays, which is your, your I think, your trash pickup days, because obviously it impairs the street sweepers from, from actually having access to the curbs. So if you, if you are in one of the impacted homes or if, uh, uh, please keep the curbs clear of any any cars or, or you know whenever your trash pickup you know just bring it in immediately so the guys would have access to to the curbs. So we work diligently with Barry and the crew um, with the the pickup of the of the, the the caucuses. So if you if you inclined put it to the curb and we'll pick it up. Um, but we're trying to make things a lot bearable. This is my job to, to speak with, with the residents. If you do see them out there and you, if you have another area that you see is impacted or you feel like some other areas within your neighborhood is not being addressed with the street sweepers or cleaning, please contact us immediately. Uh, I think we have the My Fort Worth app that is set up in which you can actually report that. So, so please feel free to, you know, to report it if, if there's another area. If we, don't, if we don't report, if you don't report it, we don't know. We, uh, Barry, and, Barry and, uh, and Chris have done a great job with the officers of, you know, going through the neighborhood and tracking everything and letting us know where we can kind of fit in and make things a lot bearable for you. So, so please, you know, just, just know that we're working hard to, to, to work with you and make sure that by next year, we don't have this problem again. So um, we appreciate your, your, your help and your patience. And, uh, and again, feel free to let us know if there's anything else we can do to make things more bearable, OK? All right, thank you so much. Hello, my name is Chris Lerat. I am the superintendent over animal control. I'm uh, Barry's boss. And I'm also the animal control officers that are out in the neighborhood every week helping y'all with the egrets and all that. Uh, I'm just gonna touch base on a little bit that you might wanna look at once we get the birds out, okay? Once the birds leave is whenever the hard work really starts, okay, it's the cleanup. That's when we need to get everything out of the trees, birds nests, uh, everything that they could come back and reuse, all right? Because we don't want them back, 
we definitely don't want them to use what's left in the trees. Uh, there's limitations to what the city can do on private property on getting these out, okay? We try to do the best we can from the road, what we can reach with what tools we have, but as your property, you have to do it, unfortunately. That means getting arbitrous. Uh, they go up there, it's, going, it's money, and it hurts, I know. Y'all gotta pay for that. Uh, but like I said, it's limitations of what we can do and what everybody, it, it's, we got to get these nests out once the birds leave. Once the birds are gone, there's preparations for next year. Okay, trimming trees, getting that all ready. My people getting stuff to help y'all next year when the birds start coming in. I brought flyers, all these flyers that I brought, there is stuff online for the city website. It's all on the egrets. I have PowerPoints that I will be addressing. We'll look at doing another meeting before next year comes, probably about three or four, just to make sure we keep everybody updated. And when January comes, on the sheet it says February. It says February to March, and I was addressed about that. So you wanna start looking out January, okay? February to March is what the state says. That's when they come in, okay? January, end of January is when we look at ground zero, okay? That's when they start flying in. Uh, you're looking for the night herrings. Night herrings, they're dark colored. They got the little yellow in the hair. Uh, those are the first guys to come in. Those are the ones that everybody thinks, oh, they're cute, they're pretty. You know, you don't want them, okay? Because if you go down to Winchester, there's several little night herrings in that tree. That's the first bird that's there. They blend in to the tree that has the nice pretty cover, okay? And I was talking to one citizen coming in here. I'm driving down the road, and Winchester was ground zero, okay? But there's a lot of ground zeros that I've seen coming in here. That could have been that house, could have been that house. You don't want to be that house, okay? So it's going to take not just the neighborhood, okay? It takes the whole city. Me and Barry's been working on this since I started with the city back in 2008, okay? Since 2008, okay? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's tough. Every year we see something different. We learn something different. Uh, I've talked to wildlife biologists. I almost feel like I have the degree now. I've been talking to them for so long. Uh, they've given me a lot of good information. I research it. I look at it. I try to pass that information on. I talk to our uh, PIO who puts the information out. There's every year I change something, okay? I changed some on our information that I put out because something new happened. COVID hit. That changed a lot because the birds just flew in. Nobody knew. Everybody was in their house hiding, you know, from COVID. And ground zero was Candle Ridge, you know, John Stone, a uh, couple other neighborhoods, about three or four blocks. We had one up north. Lady was in the hospital, didn't even know. Her house, you had about 50, 60 birds. This year, they had about 130 that tried to come in. You know, so the city, my employees that I work with, we were in two different areas, not just one, and we was working around the clock, okay? So it's not like we're not doing anything, we're trying to do the best we can for all of y'all, because we got the whole city to help. Uh, but we need your help, too. So, um, January to March, but it goes through all the way to September, October, okay? October is sometimes when they leave. I'm gonna be honest with you, Barry said late August. I mean, worst case scenario, it could be late September, you know? Uh, but we gotta be vigilant, you know? Because I definitely do not want to have to deal with it in another neighborhood next year. So if 
you know people, pass it along, let them know what we're going through this year. John Stone, a lot of them told, you know, they told the people last year, hey, look out. We had a lot of people running around with pots and pans, you know, clapping them. You know, it, that's what it takes if that's all you can do. Uh, we got incineraries that we bought, the city. Uh, we have permits for that. So a lot of people can't use that. You got to be careful because I don't want y'all getting in trouble with PD and all that. PD knows what we do. They know what we're doing all year. Uh, we're going to get ready for next year. Once these birds get out, we'll come. We'll be out, you know, every day doing what we do. And then next year we'll, we'll be out again. Y'all going to see us around all year round because we're not going nowhere. Hopefully the birds do, though. I'll give you back to Mr. Williams. Um, so uh, before I talk about the council plan that we're working on, I just want to give a huge shout out and thanks. Um, to code compliance, to animal control, to Fourth PD. They've been working around the clock, um, f um, just really trying to make this situation, um, you know, um, as, as lighter of an of a impact on y'all as possible. I um, also want to thank each of you for calling our office. Um, you know, you all help us to address issues, day-to-day um, -day issues that you um, experience every day. And so thank you all for emailing us and calling, it up, calling us. I also want to give a huge shout out to my district director, uh, Mr. Kendall Locke. Um, he's been filled in a lot of your calls um, while, you know, I'm working on the long-term plan um, from a policy perspective. He's um, coordinating with the departments day-to-day. -day. So thank you all, thank you all, thank you all. Um, I, I will share with you all um, all of our contact information. Um, you know, egrets is an important issue right now, but each of you will have, you know, additional issues coming up. And just know that um, our office is um, open um, and it works for you all. And so please continue that. Um, we really appreciate that. Um, from my perspective as, as your representative on council, um, one of the things that I'm really focused on, um, and I, I work with Kendall um, a lot on this, is thinking about like how do we address this issue, not just for like the, the here and now, um, but how do we ensure that we're addressing migratory birds um, of all sorts, whether they're egrets or any other species? Um, how do we ensure that we're um, working with um, our city departments to create a plan um, that you know, we can continue to implement with fidelity long after I'm gone and long after um, the next representative is gone as well? Um, and so, you know, what we've been working on is a three-step approach in partnership with um, the departments that I've named. Um, the first piece is, is really about education. Um, the plan that we're putting forward um, is, is really designed to get the word out faster um, and, and more efficient in ways that you all like to be communicated with, right? Like the website is an important first step, but um, we have to go deeper and deeper in neighborhoods with our education. And so the plan will um, authorize the city department to do, go above and beyond on an education basis. Um, I think education piece is so important, um, especially um, in that uh, late September to January period before the egrets are back for the next season, um, because it's important for all of us as residents to know how we all can do our part um, to ensure that we're deterring egrets from nesting during the season. Um, I think that the second part is that deterrence piece. Um, we need your help in deterring them, but also the city staff, um, once council authorizes the city staff to do more, um, we can come out and help deter. Um, and so there will be a deterrence piece in this plan to make sure that egrets are not nesting in our neighborhoods. Um, the third piece is a conservation perspective. Um, you know, with me having a doctorate in environmental science, um, I, I really understand how important conservation is. Um, and right now with, these, with the egrets being federally protected, um, it, we really have to be uh, strategic with how we relocate birds to more suitable habitat. And so one of the things we're working with in partnership with um, a, a program that was relatively new in the city of Fort Worth, the Open Space Conservation Program is a fund that allows us to find um, you know, suitable open space areas and purchase that um, as conservation areas for long term. And so um, this plan will um, authorize um, the city staff to relocate birds that haven't um, laid eggs um, in their nest yet um, and relocate them to suitable habitats. Um, if you've ever been to Fort Worth Nature Center, that's a classic example uh, of, of what we're talking about when we talk about open space conservation areas. Um, and I think that um, long term, um, that's a comprehensive plan that, um, of course, requires all of us doing um, our part, um, but that ultimately helps us to reduce the impact that egrets have. 
Um, you know, I'm also really sensitive to the financial impacts that um, this has on our neighborhoods. And so we'll also be having conversations about um, how to help address some of the impacts that um, are especially in our common areas, but um, even in our neighborhoods as well where law permits. Um, so I just wanted to present that to you to let you know that um, that's the plan that I'm working with the departments. Um, and after you know your questions and um, the stories that y'all shared this um, evening, um, that'll help me go back and inform the work that we're planning um, with your experiences as well. So thank you um, in advance. Um, we're gonna open up the floor for a Q&A and I'm gonna ask my friends um, from uh, the city of Fort Worth to come stand up here with me. Um, we'll have an extra microphone for you if you have questions or if you want to share just a real quick sound bite um, of how you've been impacted by egrets. Um, that way we'll make sure that we have as many perspectives as possible as we continue to advocate for y'all um, from a city council perspective. So um, with that being said, I'm going to invite Kendall Lockup. He's going to help me facilitate this. And um, we'll bring around the mic to you if you have any questions about what you can do to prepare for the next season or if you want to share some issues about how you've uh, been impacted um, with egrets. Um, I'll just say uh, from a protocol perspective, um, if you can um, talk in sound bites, that'll be great because I know there's a lot of folks here and we want to make sure that we have time uh, for all those who are uh, wanting to, um, you know, express a question or express how they've been impacted in particular so that, um, you know, we all have a chance to lift up our perspective. So thank y'all in advance and I'll come around with the mic for you, okay? Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, like Councilmember Williams said, my name is Kendall Locke, um, and I'm the district director for District 6. And I know I've talked with many of you guys already um, and had conversations, come to some of you guys' houses. We've rode around the neighborhood. Um, but like Councilmember Williams said, today is just literally having a conversation and, and listening from you guys about the egrets. Um, we are in the process of scheduling a few additional meetings um, in September and in the following months to touch on a few other things that are important and that are happening uh, across the city that's having an effect on us um, as neighbors. So um, we will get started with questions um, and just kind of raise your hand and Councilmember Williams will And so um, just raise your hand, Councilman Williams will bring over a mic. Um, and so, like I said, just questions that are about egrets um, in particular, about preventative measures. Um, maybe you need to pick our brain about what's something that you can do, what kind of noisemaker do you need to purchase, uh, what kind of tree trim do you need to get, those different kind of questions. So we will get started. Uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm Secretary of Wedgwood South Neighborhood, and two years ago we had an infestation of two or three houses, and it was just awful. The stench a block away, I walk with the neighbor, we wouldn't even go near that street. It cost the man whose house was mainly affected $5,000 to have his trees trimmed, his yard dug up about four inches down, and his shrubs replaced. He installed bright lights, he installed scare-eye balloons, and he had sound that came on automatically. But what we did this past January, our neighborhood association was proactive. We mailed via postal service an, an educational mailing with information about the scouts that come in February and pictures and what they could do to deter it and we included the Fort Worth um, website and we had signs posted. We had 20 signs placed strategically throughout our neighborhood at intersections where people would see it. We had an army of people who fought the egrets, and luckily they did not come in our neighborhood, but we directly mailed, not email, but via postal service, every registered, every homeowner's address between Woodway and Kingswood and Alta Mesa and French Lake. So we educated first, and we had good compliance. Thank you so much. And for those of y'all who couldn't hear, um, just to summarize that, um, my friend and neighbors, uh, 
um, down in Wedgwood. They basically implemented um, a really robust education program um, from mailing um, information about what folks can do to prevent egrets from roosting um, on their property um, to, um, you know, posting signs all across the neighborhood about um, how folks can prepare for the upcoming migratory season, and they saw success there. So thank you for the work that y'all did in the neighborhood. I know that it required um, some elbow grease, and I appreciate that. Um, and that's really, um, you know, we want to replicate that all across the city, right? The, uh, us as neighbors and neighborhoods have some best practices out there, and uh, from a council perspective, we're going to be really focused on how do we do that type of education citywide, and how can the city help with some of that education and the costs with that. So thank you for that. And I'll also mention that um, we've been in contact, our council office has been in contact with the Communications and Public Engagement Department, and in our conversations, um, literally within the past two weeks, that has been something that the director of that department has brought up is piecing together some of those different programs, such as mailers, the signs. Um, of course, still doing things digitally, and we'll do a more, robo more, more robust digital program next year with videos and different things that will be disseminated not only through the city channels, but through the homeowners associations and neighborhood associations. But printed material is definitely um, kind of at the forefront going into next year because we know a lot of people – I mean, if you're being honest, you don't have the time to check the website or you're not looking at the website or you're not on Facebook. So we're trying to meet you guys where you are. And so uh, that's definitely at the forefront. And I've been getting that from a lot of you guys in our conversations and just emails. So we're keeping that definitely at the forefront. Uh, next question. Here's my question. Because a lot of times people, they left our last meeting and everybody heard something different. What I want to know is this, have they quit nesting and are the, the brown birds that we're seeing walking in yards that are egrets, I don't know if they have the yellow thing on their head or not, and the brown ones are flying into neighbor's trees over there on court side, are they still nesting or is nesting over? From all indications that we've seen thus far, they are not nesting anymore now they you will see them still in trees where you'll think wow there's five egrets in my tree and they'll have twigs in their mouth because the whole time they're nesting through the season they go get twigs and stuff and then they have to rebuild and work on their nest while and then they fly off and and go get food for the babies and come back and this goes on constantly so as a result of uh, them nesting where they they did on Winchester we were getting calls just like every day multiple multiple calls I've got birds in my trees so we would go out there and and even we had help from Candle Ridge uh, neighborhood association going out there Matt Maxwell helped us and would we would look every time because we were worried that maybe they were trying to nest and they were just late late but everything from up to this point has we believe that they're completely nested where they're going to be nested so and as far as we know the uh, the only place that they've nested is a couple of houses on winchester so thank you no, not a problem Thank you again for that uh, question. And from a council perspective in the future with our plan, we want to be able to track egrets as well, their migratory patterns here in the season, um, so that we can start finding hot spots so that we can do preventative measures um, where we've seen egrets nest in the past. So we'll come. Yes, ma'am. What happened if there were eggs in there and you took them, but the parents still stayed here? How do the parents know where you took them and they're still going to going to build new nests? Um, because they're federally protected, we're not allowed to touch the nest, um, both the city and also residents. Um, we're not allowed to disturb the nest once there are eggs um, in the nest. So, yeah, but... Let me touch base. So, so okay. So, in, in reference to some nests, whenever we first started dealing with the nest and the egress was coming in, I have a permit that would allow me to get into the nest take the birds, the bird eggs, 
and scare off the rest of them, okay? I also have a, that permit also allows me to take a bird, which is basically kill it, okay? So we didn't do any killing of any large egrets. We took the eggs, we destroyed the nests, and we scared off the birds to go fly somewhere else, okay? My, do my director said do not take any birds because you can only take it with a shotgun. That's the permit. There's specifications and limitations on the permit, okay? We filled that permit up. Um, I, my permit was done whenever they got to Winchester, okay? Uh, that's the permit that everybody is talking about. I, because I'm with the city, I submitted for the permit for the city, for all over the city. Uh, the airports also have a permit, but that's only for the airports. Is it only for so many birds, or is it There's, a time? No, it's a limitation for how many you can take. The federal government gives you a limit on each breed. So I can only take that limit for that breed. How do we avoid the birds coming back? And I think you guys addressed that through once you did the take of the nests and the eggs, there were a number of us that helped out in trying to make sure they did not come back to that area. And so both that, that tree behind the church as well as the one that was behind on the other side of the fence, I think that's how we've maintained or the city's maintained not having birds come back in those areas. I think the timing was of a un, unfortunate by the time it, the three weeks that it took to get them cleaned out, they had started migrating to other trees. Barry and the city ran out of permits, and so they were sort of at a loss with being able to do any more to help that part of the community. So, so that that is correct, and and that's why we said early on that it is very important in their next year's coming to make sure that you're vigilant for watching for the for the scout birds because the the ones that cause the huge damage are the white egrets or cattle egrets they're the ones that come in hundreds at a time the gray herrings and are known as scout birds night herrings they're different there's a lot of different breeds but they're the ones that they'll come in about two or three you won't even know they're in the net in your tree they don't make a lot of noise they fly at night a lot they come in late in the evenings and then once they build that nest and get those eggs laid it it's almost like a homing beacon for the white egrets and and once they get in then it then you're you're in big trouble I, I know houses in, in, in all the neighborhoods around here that have had a couple of night herrings in them. They've nested. And fortunately, they nested, they, lived, they, they grew up, and they left. And, and you didn't have a big impact of a lot of white egrets coming in. But then we have the total opposite of that effect, where a couple of birds get in, the homeowner does not have any idea they were in there, and then all of a sudden they walk out one day and there's 50 birds. Then a week later they walk out, there's 100 birds. So during this time, in, in, in our last year in Candle Ridge, when, when we were fighting them, three officers from animal control picked up a little under a, around 1,000 birds. So you can imagine the scope of that. So that's what this is all about. And we believe they're nested. We don't believe they're nested anywhere else. We haven't had any reports. And uh, as you know, this is big neighborhoods. And, and, and so we haven't had any other reports. We don't believe they're nested. We, we, we just need to be vigilant when these birds leave and getting the nest out of the trees. Next year, trimming the trees back. You know, we're not saying you got to cut your tree down. We're saying you need to have like 80% uh, cover in there and get 20% of it out. Because, and, and these particular birds are attracted to uh, post oak. They're, 
That's just the tree they like. And there's a limitation to when an arborist will want to trim those trees because of disease. So be diligent about thinking about an arborist and get online, look at some different ones and study it and then get online and look at it. There's a lot of information out there on egrets that we're telling you tonight, but there's a lot out, still out there. Thank you for that, Barry. I think we had a few over here, Kendall, and then Anita, we'll come to you as well, okay? Um, hi, um, her and I were wondering, are the blue herons, are they protected as well as a species? Anything that's a migrating bird, blue herrings, snowy egrets, so the uh, on night the herrings, they're all protected. They're all, protected. They're all migratory birds. Uh, there are ducks. They're migratory birds. There's right. a whole bunch of... There's a, probably about 30,000 birds that are oh. protected. Okay. And it's online. You can look at all of them. Right. It's well, a I'm long two list. houses down from the bird tree, <laughs> so um, the smell and seeing the poor little baby birds dead and dying is not my thing. But I'm wondering what is or up to the limit that we're allowed to, as they're trying to nest, what is our limitation as a homeowner to protect our house, our roof, our trees, besides just trimming back the trees and scaring them off. What is our limitation? Because you all come out with the flashbangs. I don't think we can do that, can we? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, well, Barry was out there. Uh, we did have PD come out there. We did have Wildlife and Fishery came right. out there. They didn't know we had a permit. Uh, the un, it was a, whenever they went out there and they found out we had a permit, they kind of mm. ran off and said, have a nice day because uh -huh. they didn't want to be involved. All right. Uh, the, your limitation is basically as long as the birds are trying to nest. Just you nesting, can, collecting. If they're collecting stuff, if you see them collecting in your tree, uh -huh. shoo them off. Okay. Scare them off. Right. If they're trying to make nests in your trees, get a stick. Try to get up there and get the nest right. out. Don't let them do anything. In your I'm, tree. Well, what I'm wondering is, between the time that I realized uh, animal control actually let me know that I had a blue herring in my tree, then like literally a week or two later, a hundred of the friends of the blue of the white herons came, and all of a sudden the the blue herons, were, I mean the the blue egrets, the blue birds were gone, and all the white birds were in. Yeah, the white birds my scared out the blue. The blue, the white, they're all noisy, they're all nasty, um, you know. Do we have any kind of idea if they're going to get rid of this federal protection? Because it sure doesn't seem like they need too much protecting. So the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 18, uh, 19, 18, 1918? I'm thinking it's a little outdated. 1918? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's between like 36 countries. And they have tried to get 36 countries together to do something with it. Uh, uh, they've been trying to do that for years. Oh. So. Well, they haven't had them live in their tree, so. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> you know, Carrollton, Carrollton seen the same thing, and they thought they was just going to go out there and do what they wanted because, oh, this is outdated. They got $40,000 worth of fines oh okay okay that's why and i'm asking like what is our limitation as a homeowner besides seeing them do the sticks and running them off what at what me. point what point do you realize that they're there and they've nested and they have eggs sometimes you just don't know and they blend into the sky and the leaves you can't see them i get that you know i drive down through neighborhoods and i catch myself looking up and i don't want to run into nobody <laughs> so it's it's tough it is very tough. Uh, me and Barry, we run all over the place. Right. Barry doesn't have great eyes. My eyes are not great either. We miss things. Right. But if you get a neighborhood yeah. together or a city together, you'd be surprised what everybody can do. Right. Right. So it's just being vigilant. Talk to your neighbor. Let right. them know. Let us know. We'll come out with the bangers and the incinerators. Okay. The now, to... another part of the question is, what do we do once they're gone? Because I have a neighbor 
where his one tree is affected next to the one that looks like a big cotton ball exploded. Uh, so um, once those birds are gone, you say it's up to the person that owns the house or whatever. I mean, are we going to get any kind of help money-wise in combination to what we do to, to clean it up? So a great question. And, um, you know, from my perspective on the council, that's why I'm working so hard on this plan. I mean, is um, there going to be like some joint thing where the where the homeowners and mm -hmm. y'all can kind of where we can pull money together to help those who can't clean it up? So that that is well received and we will bring that um, okay. in discussions and the plans. Thank you for that. I know that the financial impact is huge. Um, that's why this plan is so important. That's why the, the education piece where if we're all um, you know, aware in the city's leveraging the resources that we have to make sure that we get the word out to residents. We can all be looking so that it's not on one neighbor, right, to have to spot that bird. And so um, this plan is going to be comprehensive. Um, that has come up in our conversations, and I want to keep continuing to bring that up as well uh, to see what type of uh, fund we can create long term. So um, for those of y'all who didn't hear, she asked, um, will there be a fund for the end of this season? Um, currently, there are uh, not funds available for this, um, which as a representative, uh, that's something that I'm very sensitive to um, in determining how do we really address this uh, systemically. Well, I know that some of the work that we do from a policy perspective doesn't happen like tomorrow, um, but I want to make sure that we're addressing this like once and for okay, all. Okay, so we're not going to be forgotten in the loop no. anywhere. Okay. No, you won't all be right. forgotten. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. <laughs> so we'll have uh, time. Uh, I want to honor the time in the church. Um, they have us here from 6 to 7. So we'll take about two to three more questions, and Kendall will come around um, before rounding off. Also, at the end of this event, if you all like to continue the conversation with us, um, we'll hang around for maybe five to ten extra minutes. We can share with you our contact information if you'd also like to call our office. That way we're making sure we're getting um, all of your feedback and perspective, okay? Okay, my question was going to be about the law that was passed where it's made these little darlings to where you can't do anything to them. Well, you're saying that there's other countries that have signed a treaty, uh, an agreement, whatever it might be. Why can we not pull out of that agreement? <laughs> so the question was um, in regards to the federal treaty um, and whether or not we could pull out of that. Um, that is definitely a congressional um, conversation and a discussion that the Congress would have to um, act on. Um, we have uh, congressional representatives that um, we also um, you know, want to build a working relationship with as well. Um, but that's definitely going to be an act of Congress to um, you know, amend that treaty um, or to make other provisions that allow cities to address migratory birds in a different way. So we need to get after Congress is what you're saying. Everybody hear that? Congress? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can't you guys, like, use hawks, owls? You know, the, where I live, we have a hawk. We have actually two or three of them. And they fly around between about two or three houses. I live on Winchester. Okay, so even in Candle Ridge, there is a lot of hawks flying around. And... If they go to a nest and, and take a bird or if they knock one out, that, that they're, that's totally legal. I mean, that's nature. But as a, a protected bird, we can't use hawks or anything. Now, as I said before, we had a permit, and we got that permit. This was the first year. But it's natural if a hawk attacks another bird, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. But that's what I'm saying. So they can do that. But we can't physically set that up. To, it, it would be just like us uh, being able to shoot them with a 12-gauge. So, But here's the good news. Here's, here's what we're trying to do. So Chris spent a lot of time doing the paperwork. We with a fishing game, we contacted them, we talked to them, and we have established kind of hopefully a working relationship with them. So all over the United States, they deal with this as well. So we're hoping all the birds and the eggs that we removed this year with our permit, we have to keep track of that, then we have to submit that to the state or to the federal government and we're hoping next year we get a better permit we get more we get the ability to deal with them 
strong, more strongly. Now, this year, we took hundreds of eggs to, to the, you know, still. So, we, like Chris said, we didn't, we didn't kill any bird. And we took them to a rehabber. So we're, we're proud of that fact, but we're hoping that we have a better permit, we have better communication, we're working even on trying to get a drone that is infrared, state of the art, so that when we do have to run these egrets off, we can track them better, we can see them better, where they go, we can push them out. Because once we get them nested somewhere else, if they're out in the country, then they're not an issue. And they'll come back there every year. All right, well, what about uh, using speakers to make loud noises? You know, put a speaker in there, you could okay. put it on a loop. Yeah. Um, buying some fake hawks, some fake owls. The fake yeah. hawks, fake owls will yeah, work. That costs money, but it's cheaper yeah. to have, and you yeah. guys come by every so yeah, often. Yeah, that, that works. And people were putting balloons up with faces on them they in the trees they were doing all and and a lot of it was helping and working uh what i'm what we worry about at code and with the police department is that you can go online get and you can get fireworks you can get all kinds of stuff people were firing fireworks and stuff at birds that were just flying over so if you get an entire neighborhood riled up and they're and they're firing just every time they see a bird we had people firing at ducks so what happens and then what happens and i'm going to tell you what happens when you do that all of a sudden the police department is doing multiple calls out for gunfire and it just creates this chaos we found that out firsthand in Kennel ridge so what we ask you to do is use pots and pans and it works and use boards and it works. Well, what's going to end up happening? Somebody's going to fall off the tree and get hurt really bad. Well, they don't. You, you don't have to be climbing the tree. Yeah, I mean, you're. Yeah, you don't need to climb your trees. Yeah, don't get in your trees. Have an arborist, trained professionals, do that. Uh, so, uh, because you're right, you will fall out. Uh, you. So, but anyway, I want to touch base on that because I didn't want people getting all worked up, and then. Because there's a city ordinance, if you're firing, and we had people that we pretty sure were firing guns at them. First of all, they're federally protected. Second of all, you're committing a crime, and uh, it was just not good for anybody. And it's not good for the neighborhood. So that's Thank you for that, Barry. Um, Kendall, if we can go over to Anita for the last question. And remember, um, we're short on time, but please come talk to us after the event, um, and we'll make sure that um, you know we engage in that conversation after. So we'll still hang around. Thank you. My question was about the permitting, and you are we guaranteed to get it next year, this year? That that's what it concerns me. The number of birds and eggs, Peggy. Peggy is here. She had, I don't know how many birds in her trees, but what if we use up a permit and there's still nests there? H how does all that work? I'm concerned about going forward, how we can be guaranteed of getting that permit and removing everything that needs to be removed if other areas in the, in the city also have egrets. Okay, so no, the permit is not guaranteed, right? Uh, that's why I had to build a relationship with the federal government, along with several wildlife biologists to get them to help me fill out per part of the permits, because I have to get uh, paperwork from the USDA, wildlife people, also wildlife and fishery, and me filling out several forms and giving them a guideline of what they're expecting me to do before I even take anything. So it's a, it's a long process. I submitted it probably in November and I finally got it like April 1st. So the birds were already coming to us. So it's, there's no guarantees anything with wildlife, I'm gonna be honest with you. You know, it, it's tough, 
you know, but I think I worked out a good relationship with them, and I filled out the forms correctly, thank God, you know. So, uh, and they gave, they gave it to us. The only thing is, is they do, you know, they have to look at the impact on everything. So they look at the impact on the wildlife along with, because they're, they're not going to give a permit to somebody that's just going to go out there and start firing off a shotgun. Uh, I had to show them the whole lay of the land, saving as many birds. Even though I did take eggs and all that and break nests and all, I was still bringing the eggs to a wildlife rehabber that is licensed with the federal birds. So with all of that, we, we have guidelines and limitations even with that, but nothing is guaranteed. And uh, I'm hoping that I, I know the whole process now, so it should be a little bit easier. And I've made that relationship with the USDA and Wildlife and Fishery, which uh, I've been knowing them for 14 years, so it should be a good relationship. So, uh, but yeah. And I just want to say, you know, special thanks again to our team and specifically to you, Chris. I know it's not easy to get federal permits. Um, and from, you know, uh, council representative, we want to work with y'all moving forward. Um, for those of y'all don't know, we um, have a lobby team um, that has a federal program. Um, each um, year we go to Washington, D.C. with a list of agenda items that are important to us and we talk to our um, not only our Tarrant County uh, delegation but we talk with um, you know um, representatives um, from all over the country on issues that are important to us um, and this will be uh, something that I'm presenting to our lobby team um, because part of this um, part of our issue is with um, working with our federal um, you know representatives and with um, our departments to make sure they're working together to um, really address this issue in a way that's meaningful to you all as neighbors and also that um, um, puts forth some best practices in conservation um, so like Chris said we are conserving as many um, of these egrets um, as possible and moving them to um, you know more a suitable habitat so um, with that being said thank you all for um, engaging in tonight's conversation thank you for um, you know your feedback I know this is um, you know a really tough issue that's impacting all of us in, in many different ways and um, as your representative I know that I'm, I'm deeply um, you know concerned um, and also, um, you know, my, my sleeves stay rolled up constantly because, uh, you know, I'm really willing to um, work on all of the issues that are important in our district. And so just know that this issue um, is a priority for our office. Um, please, please, please continue to engage with us. If y'all see new issues um, that come up, um, feel free to reach out to our office. We'll be passing out our cards um, with all of our information for our folks watching. Um, you can find our information online um, on uh, the District 6 uh, webpage. It has our office phone number and our emails. Please feel free to contact us um, with um, the issues that you're facing with egrets um, and other issues that you face from day to day. Um, like I said, um, our team will be hanging out for uh, about five to ten minutes um, to exchange contact information and to hear a little bit about um, how each of you have been impacted by um, egrets during this migratory season. So uh, thank you all again. Again, thank you to um, our friends at the Westminster Presbyterian Church. Um, you know, we really, really appreciate you all open up your space for us. Um, and we look forward to doing many more of these listening circles on a number of topics. In fact, Kendall's going to um, talk to you all about uh, some of the exciting events we have uh, for our uh, from our council office, um, including a, a back-to-school backpack uh, giveaway event that's going to happen um, right down the street at Trademark Church. So, Kendall, if you would um, give them a rundown of upcoming events. So, yeah, so we have a uh, back-to-school event that is coming up on August the 7th. That's the first Saturday in August at Trademark uh, Church. And so that will be from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. We're giving uh, upwards uh 500 backpacks uh, with school supplies geared towards uh, middle school students. Um, so if you know anyone, if you have, you know, uh, those individuals in your home or, or in your families, definitely invite them to come out. Um, it's a drive through event, so they just pull up, we give them the backpack, um, and then they continue on with their day. So that's one event that we have coming up on September the 2nd, uh, Thursday, September the 2nd at 6 o'clock. We have an event um, where we'll take a deeper dive into uh, bond projects for the district. So bond projects, looking at some things and budget priorities across the district and getting some feedback from you guys. Um, looking at redistricting, of course, we're uh, redrawing a few maps uh, or all of the council maps and adding two additional seats. So we'll 
will be uh, touching on redistricting, also um, touching on the My For Worth app and the things that are available to you through that app. Um, in addition to that, we uh, are currently planning two other uh, town halls um, that will come at later dates. One that will be geared towards um, the new My H2O uh, program that's through the water department. So, of course, many of you guys probably know there has been new meters that has been installed. So we'll be touching base about that and talking to you guys about some exciting things on how you can actually view the breakdown of your water bill, view your water usage, um, and just all of the great things with that department. And then also too, um, a town hall that's gonna be geared towards um, just traffic infrastructure, speeding, uh, things as stop signs. We've been working hard with transportation and public works. I'm um, gonna have some great things that are coming to the district as far as new stop signs, um, new signals, um, and just things that's all about traffic infrastructure. So those are a few things that are coming up. Of course, everything will be disseminated through all of the city channels, our channels. You can always reach out to the office. Um, I'll give you guys our office number if you wanna write it down. Um, and of course, I have cards that you can get as well. But it's 817-392-8806. And so that's the office number. Uh, you can feel free to reach me uh, if you text, if you call on my cell, it's 817-372-1138, 817-372-1138. Um, and like Councilmember Williams said, our office is open. Feel free to call, email, um, and we're here for you guys. So thank you for being here.